Thank you for coming. Welcome to the 2022 Coe's Lecture. Now, from our very beginning, the University of Chicago Law School, as a professional school within a research university, has been committed to interdisciplinary scholarship. And our faculty have sought to draw on knowledge and methods from other fields in order to expand our understanding of law. And how often these interdisciplinary ideas have created whole new paradigms for understanding our law, our legal institutions, and even the wider world. And often this importation of ideas from other disciplines has upended conventional wisdoms in law. Now, I think one of the most powerful example, examples of this is economic analysis of law, or law and economics. Law and economics has influenced our understanding of nearly every field of law. And in some fields of law, it is the dominant way of understanding that field of law. And in little more than a generation, law and economics became a standard feature of legal education everywhere in the United States. And it was born right here at the University of Chicago. Ronald Coase, who was the Clifton Musser Professor of Law and Economics, was one of the most important contributors to these developments. He powerfully deployed the ideas of economics to help us understand legal institutions. Now, I'm sure that all of you are familiar with the so-called Coase theorem, the idea that was contained in his highly cited article, The Problem of Social Cost. But Professor Coase also made important contributions to a number of different other areas of law, to understanding the allocation of the spectrum by the Federal Communications Commission, to our understanding of durable goods monopolies, to the private provision of public goods such as lighthouses, and importantly, to the theory of the firm. Indeed, Professor Coase was the founder of an entire field we now call transaction cost economics. In 1991, he received the Nobel Prize in economics, and he was the first professor in a law school to receive a Nobel Prize in economics. And if I'm not mistaken, he is still the only faculty member in a law school to have received a Nobel Prize in economics. The following year, 1992, this lecture series was founded to honor him and to continue to inspire this type of path-breaking inter interdisciplinary scholarship. So the specific purpose of our lecture is to share an idea or a body of knowledge from law and economics with our students, particularly our first year students. And there will be time for questions, so get your questions ready. And it's a great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Sonia Starr. Professor Starr is the Julius Krieger Professor of Criminal Law and Criminology. She is a person of enormous intellectual energy and ambition. Now, if our students here, if you've not had a class with her, I encourage you to take a class with her. And her incisive thinking and her intellectual ambition are evident in her career path. She graduated summa cum laude from Harvard College and then earned a JD from Yale Law School. She clerked for Merrick Garland, then she then judge of, on the US uh, Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, and now, as we know, Attorney General of the United States. She also clerked for Judge Mohammed Shahabuddin of the International Criminal Tribunals for Rwanda and the former Yugoslavia. And before joining our faculty, she taught for about a decade at the University of Michigan Law School. Professor Starr's scholarship is centered on empirical studies of the criminal justice system particularly measuring racial and gender disparities in that system and seeking to understand their sources. The magnitude of these disparities and their sources are a key debate among criminal law scholars today and in society at large. And in this genre, Professor Starr's work is the finest in the technical sense and the most significant with respect to the importance of their findings. Professor Starr's also expanded the boundaries of our understanding by investigating the links between the criminal justice system and labor markets. For example, she has examined the impact of expungement policies as well as ban the box legislation. Professor Starr's work has appeared in the most prominent journals, both law reviews and peer review journals. And her teaching focuses on the criminal justice system. She teaches courses in criminal law, race and criminal justice policy, and the collateral consequences of criminal convictions. Now, are all this not enough, she also gives 
generous service to the Legal Academy. She has recently been co-president of the Society for Empirical Legal Studies and chair of the AALS section on law and economics. So it's incredibly fitting to have a scholar as interdisciplinary and accomplished to speak as our 2022 COES lecturer. Professor Starr will speak on statistical discrimination and the law. Please join me in welcoming our 2022 COES lecturer. Thank you all for being here, and thanks so much to Dean Miles for that um, very generous introduction. Um, so let's consider three scenarios. Um, first, police racial profiling. Suppose a police officer stops and frisks black pedestrians at a rate three times um, the rate that he stops white pedestrians. When questioned, the officer openly admits that the disparity isn't because the black pedestrians he sees are do doing anything different than the white pedestrians he sees. It's because he takes race into account. He admits that he uses less demanding criteria of suspicion for stopping um, white, uh, black pedestrians than white ones. And he explains, look, I've been on this beat for a long time. Um, and in this neighborhood, most of the people involved in the drug trade and, uh, trade and most of the people carrying guns are black. And I'm not saying that's true everywhere. And I'm not saying most black people in the neighborhood um, are doing those things. Most of the people I stop aren't carrying anything. Um, but a share of them do have got drugs and guns on them, and that share is higher for black, um, uh, for black pedestrians than white. And if I didn't take that into account, I'd be policing less efficiently, and I'd be using my resources to stop fewer criminals. Ask yourself, is this OK reasoning for a police officer to use? Um, is it legal? Should it be? And does any part of your answer to those questions turn on whether the police officer is right as an empirical matter about the racial composition of people carrying drugs and guns in his neighborhood. Second example, gender, childbearing, and employment. So a company's hiring manager will only hire women of childbearing age if they have absolutely stellar qualifications, whereas men of the same age range um, with just uh, pretty good qualifications um, can get hired. A colleague notices this and calls her out on it. And she says, look, I'm just being realistic. Women bear the brunt of childbearing, uh, of childcare responsibilities in our society. When little Caden or Emma has to stay home from work, who do you think it is that takes a personal day away from, or stay home from school? Who do you think takes a personal day to take care of them? It's not usually dad. Um, who do you think is taking months um, of maternity leave when the next baby comes? Um, who do you think um, has to take breaks in the middle of the day to, um, uh, to breastfeed? Who do you think, or to, um, or to, or to pump, who do you think um, is more likely to stay till 7.30 every day um, to bill more hours to the client versus going home to make dinner at 6, um, at 6 p.m.? Look, I notice these things. It's unfair that society is structured that way, but it's not the company's fault. All this stuff costs the company money. And I wouldn't be a responsible marshal of our resources if I didn't take that into account. Is that reasoning legal? Does it matter if she, is it right? Does it matter if she can back that up with empirical evidence from the personnel records that show that women actually do take more personal time um, to take care of children? Three, the NFL's race norming scandal. This one is not a hypothetical. A few years back, the National Football League famously settled um, a massive class action lawsuit on behalf of thousands of former players alleging tra um, traumatic brain injuries. Um, to make a claim for cognitive uh, impairment against the settlement fund, uh, the players had to un undergo a cognitive assessment by a specialist. And this included um, submitting cognitive test scores. For several years, until very recently, um, quietly, uh, those test scores were corrected based on the, um, on the individual's race. And the way it was corrected, basically, was that um, each player's performance was being, um, on the cognitive tests, was being evaluated relative to the norms for their race based on a past study um, that was uh, carried out when the test was developed. Um, because black people had scored lower than white people in that past, um, in that past study, 
it meant that um, that uh, players had to basically um, perform uh, in a in a way that demonstrated more cognitive impairment in order to be characterized as cognitively impaired and qualify for a payout or qualify for payouts of, of higher levels if they were black than if they were white. That is, scores that were considered cognitively impaired for white people were deemed normal for a black person. Is that reasoning legal, right? And so um, is, or is, is that approach legal? And does it matter whether the NFL could cite that statistical evidence, the, the statistical generalization from the study um, where they say, look, we needed to rely on the best evidence that we could to tell us what these individuals' cognitive baseline was before they um, played and got, and got hit in the head in our, in our workplace. Um, OK, so I'm going to try to show you today that, um, first of all, all of those examples are actually pretty easy from a legal perspective. Um, they're all clearly illegal. The, um, the law doesn't recognize any of those rationales as a legitimate reason to, um, to uh, discriminate based on race or sex. And I'm going to argue that discrimination based on rationalizations like that should be illegal, that the law is right about that, um, that, they, that uh, it's hugely morally problematic to make decisions like this and to offer rationalizations like that. It sends toxic expressive messages. It ratifies and amplifies structural inequalities um, in society. None of that ceases to be true if it turns out that the, that the um, discriminator can cite some kind of empirical evidence in support of the generalization. Of the generalization. Um, all of the examples um, that I just gave are, um, are examples of what's called statistical discrimination. Um, that's a term from economics. It actually comes from the work of one of U of C's other great economists, um, the Nobel Prize winner, Gary Becker. Um, who, um, so Becker uh, was the first major economist to um, really dig into the problem of discrimination, which he saw as a puzzle for economists, its persistence. Um, he said, like, it seems on its face economically irrational. So in, a, in the employment context, why wouldn't a firm just want to pursue the most qualified workers available? Why would they ever take these irrational factors into account? Wouldn't it be um, a comparative advantage to the firms who don't discriminate. So why do we see discrimination persist? And Becker offered the theory of statistical discrimination as part of the answer. So the idea was that firms were using race as a proxy for information that they wanted that was linked in some way to what, what in their view, made a worker more qualified, right? Um, so um, that they would rely on race in situations where they didn't have a good way to gather that the, inf the information that they wanted to know about particular individual applicants. And so um, they, um, and so they um, would use race as a proxy for that. And Becker argued that this approach could be rational in the sense of serving the self-interest of the employer. Uh, if, in fact, there was an empirical basis for the underlying statistical, for the, for the statistical generalization, such that um, relying on it did improve the, um, the um, firm's ability to target the workers um, that, it, uh, that it wanted. Um, and the same theory can apply to contexts um, outside labor, too. So the police officer in our hypo says, look, I don't know which individuals are carrying drugs or guns. But in my neighborhood, they're correlated with, that's correlated with race, so I'm going to get better outcomes if I rely on race. The hiring manager says, look, there's no way for me to know individually which workers are going to take more leave, but I know it's correlated with gender. I'm going to rely on that. The NFL says we can't go back in time and figure out uh, what these players' cognitive performance looked like before they got hit in the head thousands of times in our workplace. Um, but uh, we're going to take our best guess by um, using the most detailed info that we have from past um, studies, which takes race into account. So Becker distinguished statistical discrimination from what he called taste-based discrimination, which just means discriminating against a group because you don't like the group. Um, and um, more recently, some economists have recognized a third category that you could think of as lying somewhere between those two, which they variously referred to as stereotyping or inaccurate statistical discrimination which is basically relying on, on generalizations that the employer might believe to be true, but aren't. So they're, they, they don't, in the end, really serve the employer's 
self-interest. Um, when I discuss discrimination with economists, uh, which is often, given um, my work, quite often they are surprised to learn that this distinction that's quite all important to econ literature on the subject does not exist in the law. Um, so um, note that uh, this distinction is not the same as the distinction between disparate treatment and disparate impact discrimination, um, which is legally important. Um, Case-based and statistical discrimination are both examples of types of disparate treatment discrimination. That is, they both fall within this narrow core category that basically all of our sources of anti-discrimination and equality law prohibit and sort of everybody, um, everybody agrees upon. Um, we don't parse further in the law whether the reason um, you discriminated against somebody um, based on a racial or a gender classification was because you didn't like that group or because you believed something negative about that group. Like that is a distinction in thinking that the law doesn't treat as, um, as important. Now, that said, there are many cases in which a party that you can, you, know, you can find in the case law in which a party who's accused of discrimination has tried to defend it by offering some kind of, of statistical rationale. Um, and the way this comes up is generally they're trying to get past the applicable um, level of scrutiny, right? Um, so we see it a lot in, um, in uh, sex discrimination cases where the, where the uh, defendant has openly discriminated based on sex, like they, they have a, a sex-based classification that's explicit. And they say, they try to justify it by pointing to some difference between men and women that they say like some studies support. In those cases though, um, the government offering those justifications loses again and again. Um, again and again, it gets told, um, we don't care one way or another um, about your empirical evidence. It might be statistically valid, it might not. Um, but it's not relevant. Um, and so I'm going to give you a few examples, mostly from the Supreme Court's um, gender case law, in which the court articulates a crucial principle, which is that otherwise unlawful discrimination can't be justified by resorting to statistical uh, generalizations about groups, even if those generalizations are supported by empirical evidence. Um, doing so would be unfair to the individuals within those groups um, who aren't well described by the generalization. So this approach comes from a very individualistic perspective of what uh, the goal of equality law is. Um, so examples, um, in Craig v. Boren, um, the Supreme Court struck down a law that set a higher drinking age for, uh, for men than it did for women. And in support of that law, the, the state submitted a bunch of studies that showed that men, young men, were 10 times as likely to drive drunk as young women, 10 times. That's a large disparity. There was good empirical evidence showing that this interest in protecting people from deaths from drunk driving, which one would think is an important state interest, um, was highly correlated um, with this classification that was being drawn. The court said, to hell with that. Keep your studies, we don't care about them. Because relying on them is unfair to all of the many men who don't drive drunk. Um, we can't assume that just because some do and do at higher rates than at women, that everybody, uh, that it's okay to treat all men the same way. In both Frontiero v. Richardson um, and um, Weinberger v. Wiesenfeld, um, the government had adopted administrative schemes that made the assumption um, that, uh, that women were likely to be financially dependent on their husbands and not vice versa. Um, the presumption, that presumption as an empirical matter was usually correct, especially in the 1970s when these um, cases happened. But it isn't always correct, and for that reason, the court said you can't rely on it. Um, it's a statistically unquestionable premise as a group average, but it is an overbroad generalization that can't be tolerated under the Constitution, that's a quote, um, because it was unfair to the families that it didn't describe. In US v. Virginia, the Virginia Military Institute said, in addition to physical sex differences, um, women overwhelmingly would not be, uh, would not appreciate the adversative environment that uh, VMI had for, for education. They submitted studies, court said, we don't care about your studies. We're not worried about the average woman. We're worried about the women who decide that they wanna go to VMI who are outliers presumably from that trend. Um, the court of Virginia left open the possibility that 
Um, there could be statistical generalizations allowed in the gender context, um, although it, speci it specified that this would never be true in the racial context. But they said in the gender context or sex context, I should probably say, um, that there could be generalizations um, associated with irreducible physical differences. That has proven to be a narrow exception. So the court has sometimes recognized uh, exceptions that are motivated by um, a difference in, by, the, by women's ability to get pregnant. Um, and uh, they have not extended that, though, to apply to differences in um, child care responsibilities beyond, uh, beyond childbirth itself. Sorry. <coughs> hmm. OK, there's tons of other examples in constitutional law um, and also in statutory anti-discrimination law. Um, so um, in uh, the Los Angeles um, City of Pow uh, uh, or City of Los Angeles Water and Power v. Manhart, um, the um, city wanted to rely on the actuarial generalization. That's, it, un again, unquestionably true on average that women live longer than men. Um, and they said, look, uh, so they wanted to make, make women contribute more money to the pension plan because essentially they could expect more years of pension payouts. And so they thought it was fairer to make them pay in more from the front end. And, um, and the court said, look, not all women live longer than all men. Can't rely on that. So you get the basic principle. Um, I want to point out that um, although many of these cases have arisen in the um, gender context, court has been really clear that anything, any type of logic that you can't engage in in gender cases, you definitely can't engage in in race cases, which have a, a, a higher level of scrutiny applied to them. They've also applied this principle in a socioeconomic discrimination case called Bearden v. Georgia, um, which you might think, that's weird. I thought socioeconomic discrimination doesn't get any heightened scrutiny at all. And um, that's usually true, but in criminal cases like Bearden, um, it's different because there's a, a special line of cases that has devised this kind of unique form of heightened scrutiny that applies to discrimination against indigent criminal defendants. Um, and um, Bearden uh, was out on probation, and then he lost his job. And when he lost his job, the court revoked his probation. And among the justifications given by the state was that people who lose their jobs become higher crime risks, um, that unemployment and poverty are statistically associated with uh, recidivism risk, and there were studies that supported that. Court again said, um, we, don't, uh, we don't care about those studies. Let me read um, this quote. So they say, the state cannot justify incarcerating a probationer by lumping him together with other poor persons and thereby classifying him as dangerous. This would be little more than punishing a person for his poverty. Um, OK, so I think you get the basic point. Um, so some of you might be thinking, OK, but a lot of this is from really old case law. And isn't the court getting like way more conservative on uh, equal protection issues, anti-discrimination law generally? Um, and that is true, in, but not in a way that matters for this purpose, right? The court is not stepping away from the core protection against explicit classifications based on, um, on uh, race and sex. In fact, I think we may be about to see it get more aggressive in, um, in uh, holding the line that those kinds of classifications are, um, are never permitted. Um, the, many of the cases I just mentioned were written by conservative justices. Many of them were unanimous. This principle has always cut across ideological lines um, on the court, precisely because it involves this core category of disparate treatment discrimination. So I don't think you have to be a progressive to be behind the principle that I just established. And uh, empirically, many of the, uh, the court's conservative justices have adamantly supported it. But that said, I do think that if you are a progressive, you should care about this principle. You should care about it from the perspective of uh, um, what's called an anti-subordination principle, um, uh, uh, that our law of equality should be worried about things that exacerbate structural inequalities in our society and, sort of, and put some groups uh, down below others. Because discriminatory behavior that relies on negative stereotypes about groups essentially sends expressive messages endorsing those stereotypes. It, um, it uh, amplifies structural inequalities in society. Um, and you know, uh, and um, nothing about that is alleviated at all 
by the discriminator's ability to point to empirical evidence um, supporting the, um, the justification. Okay, so that's enough doctrine. Um, let's get back to those first three examples that I gave. Um, first, no, it's not okay for our hypothetical um, police officer to racially profile. Um, racial profiling, by the way, the Supreme Court has never specifically uh, taken a case on. Um, that is to its shame, I think, particularly because it's also um, the, uh, it's also decided a bunch of Fourth Amendment cases that in practice have made it easier for uh, the police to get away with, um, with racially profiling by using, say, pre pretexts for um, traffic stops and, and that sort of thing. But it is unimaginable, I think, that if the police did take a racial profiling case in which the case was squarely presented to it in 14th Amendment terms, that it could uphold um, as legitimate the um, choosing to stop people because of their race on the basis of a generalization that, that uh, black people or other minority groups are more likely to um, be criminals. That's exactly the type of generalization that is particularly toxic and um, that I, I think would run right into all of this doctrine. Um, second, no, the hiring manager definitely can't rely on assumptions about uh, women's childcare responsibilities. That type of thing the court has rejected squarely a whole bunch of times. Um, third, the NFL case. So let me close the loop on that story. Um, as I said, race norming of cognitive um, results was happening quietly for several years until um, two players whose um, claims were denied on this, um, on this basis filed a lawsuit under 42 U.S.C. 1981, um, which, is, um, uh, which prohibits racial discrimination in the administration of contracts like settlement agreements. Um, and um, the Supreme Court has held that, co that uh, substantively Section 1981 is coextensive with the Equal Protection Clause, i.e. that strict scrutiny um, applies to um, racial discrimination um, under it. Um, and um, I think that, uh, so the NFL players, like their, their lawsuit didn't get heard on the merits. It got thrown out procedurally uh, um, uh, on um, essentially an estoppel ground. Um, um, but uh, they, the judge who said she was troubled by the allegations directed the parties to go into mediation where after some months they came up with an agreement to abandon the race norming practice. Uh, I think if the court had ruled on the merits, I think there's no doubt that they were right. It is, again, I think impossible to imagine a U.S. court squarely presented with the, um, with the arguments saying that it was okay um, to uh, treat um, black and white players differently under the settlement based on the statistical generalization that black people aren't as smart as white people, which was exactly what the NFL was arguing. They didn't even try to frame it as a correction for testing bias or, um, uh, or something like that. They made this argument repeatedly in legal filings during um, 2020 and 2021. During a time, by the way, when the NFL's end zones were on league orders emblazoned with the words end racism in huge letters. So FYI. Um, so, okay, so you might be wondering, like, is this going to be a talk where um, I'm just telling you all the things that the law has gotten clearly right? Um, and the answer is uh, no, law professors don't give those kinds of talks. Um, so I am now going to give you the bad news, um, which is that the race norming practice that the NFL engaged in is hardly isolated, and in fact, very similar practices not only pervade the practice of medicine and many corners of our society, but also in several ways are embedded in the legal system itself. So I'm going to give you three examples again. Okay, example one, calculation of tort damages. Um, you may have learned uh, in, that in torts and other civil lawsuits, um, for injuries and wrongful deaths, often the biggest component um, of a, a plaintiff's damage award is lost earnings. And especially when the plaintiff is um, a child for whom you don't have uh, earnings history or a young person, um, the, uh, in calculating lost earnings, um, juries tend to rely quite heavily on expert reports that, um, that uh, project into the future kind of factually what the person's um, earnings, lifetime earnings would have been. In reaching, so it's, it, they're usually forensic economists that prepare these projections. And, uh, and the economists almost universally rely on actuarial tables based on earnings and life expectancy 
that are race and gender specific. So what that means is, uh, for example, that when a black little girl is killed, um, that her counterfactual lifetime um, income will be estimated based on what black women have earned in the past. And she's going to get a very different award than in an otherwise identical case of a little white boy would have, um, would have gotten. And so her life is quite literally valued by the tort system in a way that turns um, on her race and sex. So I feel like the conflict between this case law that I just outlined to you should be fairly obvious. I don't think I have to spell it out. Um, I want to ask, like, for what state interest are we allowing this to happen every day in America? Um, for a little more actuarial accuracy in applying the make whole principle for, um, for plaintiffs, I guess. Um, that, I will submit, is a state interest that doesn't even come close to satisfying the strict scrutiny standard or even the intermediate scrutiny standard. Um, the contribution to accurate forecasts for an individual is actually very low because um, there's a huge amount of individual variation within race and sex groups in lifetime earnings and in life expectancy. Um, and so you actually know very little about what a person will earn if, if, you, know their, um, if you know their race and sex. Um, and that's true despite the disparities that exist at the group level um, on average. So you get at best a marginal improvement in accuracy. It's actually even worse than that because it may be that relying on these things um, that on the race and gender specific tables makes accuracy worse. Why? Well, because it takes the disparities that affected past generations and extrapolates them forward into the future. So our hypothetical little girl who died, we're speculating about what she would have made, um, uh, what she would have earned 50, 60 years into the future. And we're taking, to inform that, um, the, um, the data about uh, the disparities that affected her grandmother or maybe her great-grandmother, right? Um, now, disparities, racial disparities and sex disparities have proven persistent in our society, but not that persistent, right? Like they have narrowed over time. And if they continue to narrow over the next 50 or 60 years, then it could be that relying on these obsolete disparities to estimate her future income would be worse than not taking um, race um, or gender into account, even if your only goal is to maximize actuarial accuracy. Um, it's also not even impo important, I, or it's not even obvious to me how important actu accurate damage calculations are as a state interest, right? We compromise on the make whole principle all the time. We make it really hard for plaintiffs to recover non-economic damages attorney's fees, even though we know that that leaves them in the hole deeply um, compared to the harms they've actually suffered. Uh, this, uh, on the other hand, for deterrent reasons, we allow some, um, uh, or some plaintiffs to recover punitive damages far exceeding um, the make whole principle. So we compromise on this in, in other ways. It seems inconceivable to me that we have to stick to it so firmly that any marginal um, that avoiding a marginal departure from it at best would constitute a compelling state interest requiring us to rely on a race-based classification. I think it's outright indefensible uh, doctrinally and morally. And yet here we are in 2022 and nobody's challenging it. Um, there are virtually no uh, court decisions considering the constitutionality of this practice. There's just a couple. There's a few cases in which courts have decided as a matter of discretion um, that they think it's more appropriate to use um, non-separated uh, actuarial tables. But there's virtually none deciding it um, on constitutional grounds. And in fact, um, plaintiffs are not raising the challenges, even when their own interests are affected. Um, plaintiffs' um, experts are sometimes submitting tailored uh, calculations like this that disadvantage their own clients. Um, and um, in one case in which the district court did ask an expert to submit um, an alternative estimate that was based on blended tables rather than separated tables, the, um, the, the uh, forensic economist um, expressed surprise. He said he had submitted uh, similar reports in thousands of previous cases and not once had he been asked to submit one that was not tailored um, in this way. Um, okay, second example, uh, death penalty administration. In 2002, in Atkins v. Virginia, 
the Supreme Court held that defendants below a certain level um, of intelligence um, could, not be ever, uh, could not constitutionally be executed. Intelligence tests normed by race in exactly the same way that they were in the NFL case have been used in at least eight states um, uh, to determine whether, um, whether defendants meet that, um, meet that threshold. Um, so it basically works just like it did in the NFL case, but here the stakes are truly shocking. A number of defendants um, have been, um, have been uh, sentenced to death and some of them have actually been executed even though their performance on non-race normed um, uh, uh, tests of intelligence were um, sufficiently low that they would clearly have been categorized, like not even near the, the kind of constitutional borderline, but clearly categorized as um, intellectual, in, intellectually disabled had they been white. Um, okay, so this, I don't even know what to say about these cases. I wrote down some things to say, though, so I'm probably going to say them. <laughs> um, so, doctrinal. So, first of all, this is disgusting. Um, second, doctrinally, this raises both an equal protection concern for all of the reasons that I just raised, and an Eighth Amendment concern because nothing in Atkins suggests that the concerns that we should have under the Eighth Amendment about uh, about um, uh, executing people who are intellectually disabled should turn on their race or whether they or whether um, their intellectual performance is within you know falls enough off the bell curve for their race that um, uh, that um, it, it uh, like you know that's 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 not the reasoning of Atkins right um, and remember that um, and oh and by, uh, by the way sometimes they also they they say that they they norm it for the cultural group, which also includes socioeconomic factors. So they're looking specifically at like poor Mexican American um, uh, uh, people in Texas or something like that. They're narrowing it that that much. And because this is occurring in the criminal justice system, then I think the Bearden precedent that I talked about about socioeconomic discrimination in the um, in the criminal justice system applies to the use of, of that kind of norming as well. Um, okay, so sometimes in these cases, the justification that's given uh, by, the, um, by the prosecution's expert for adjusting the defendant scores upward is that the tests are biased against, uh, is that IQ tests are biased against black or Hispanic defendants. Um, so I wanna, um, so some of you may think, aren't they though? Like, are they biased? And if so, like, is that a legitimate um, defense of this practice? So a couple things about that. So first of all, even if the testing bias claim is true on average, it's still a statistical generalization. And any adjustment would be a rough kind of average guess at how much you need to correct in a particular case. I do not think that where a person's life is at stake, like in the death penalty context, in a context where, by the way, the Supreme Court has emphasized the importance of individualized determination of everything, right? That relying on that kind of upward adjustment um, is is enough to justify um, to justify an execution. Um, second, it's, it strikes me as just unbelievably perverse that in a country where standardized tests of all sorts are used to determine all kinds of life opportunities, that the case in which all of a sudden we have this big concern for correcting testing bias is where it allows the state to put the victim of that testing bias to death um, to correct for it, right? Um, so let's contrast the situation with another one, um, a historical example. Um, so in the 1980s, the Department of Labor encouraged states and private employers to use something called the General Aptitude Test Battery to evaluate um, potential um, job applicants. Um, for several years in the 1980s, because this test had a racially disparate impact, um, uh, with labor's encouragement, um, the test results were being reported with race norming, like with, um, with racial adjustments to the scores. This was happening fairly quietly. When it came out, there was a huge political backlash. Um, it, the, the, the Reagan era Department of Justice actually threatened to sue Reagan's own Department of Labor for promoting this, um, this practice. And in the 1991 um, Civil Rights Act, when Congress um, passed amendments to Title VII, uh, it nearly unanimously banned the practice of race norming 
um, as uh, in the employment context. Note, this is a context where it's basically being used for affirmative action purposes. Um, and so we now live in a world where essentially the same kind of task corrections cannot legally be used when it promotes equal employment opportunity, but can be used when it allows the, um, uh, the victim of the, of the testing bias to be, uh, uh, to be put to death. Um, okay, third, third example, risk assessment in criminal justice. So this is a, a broader criminal justice context. So in recent years, um, actuarial or algorithmic predictions of crime risk, like the chance that a defendant's gonna commit another crime in the future, have been used in the sentencing stage, in the bail stage, um, in the parole stage, um, lots of parts of the criminal process. Um, and the idea is they're like, uh, algorithms is sort of a fancy word, they're, they're checklists, like where you, um, where uh, each, you answer a bunch of questions and each one represents like a risk factor that adds to your um, risk score. And uh, the way the checklists are devised though is based on um, past statistical studies of past behavior. And so um, essentially anything that gets included in this checklist, um, uh, if it's, co it's correlated with crime in a past study, so you might get sentenced for longer or less likely to get bail, et cetera, because of the behavior of other people that shared that past, those um, characteristics with you. Okay, so what characteristics do they use? Well, first of all, they don't use race. Um, in interestingly, in this context, everybody seems to agree that using race itself would be unconstitutional. They do, however, use a bunch of other factors, which are all statistically correlated with race, um, and they include a bunch of socioeconomic factors that are essentially just indicators. Some of them do anyway, they all vary, but, um, but uh, they, they're indicators of poverty, like do you have difficulty paying bills? Do you have a history of housing instability? Sometimes things about your family, like um, how, were your parents ever incarcerated? Um, these are all things that statistics say predict future crime risk, and so they'll count against you and maybe get you a longer, um, a, a longer sentence. So um, I think this practice runs straight into the problem in Bearden, right, where um, the court says, you can't rely on the statistical generalization that uh, somebody that poor people commit uh, more crime because that's unfair to all the poor people that don't commit crime, right? Um, um, I started writing about this topic about eight or nine years ago, and I have been um, trying to hammer that doctrinal point home um, since. And uh, like, I guess I'm going to just keep doing it until like any defense attorneys. Um, start making the argument in court, which as far as I can tell from the case law, doesn't really seem to have happened. So note to, to any of you um, who um, plan to, uh, to, practice, um, to practice criminal defense. Um, so, um, you know, when I also started writing about this, there wasn't a lot of political pushback. Now there's been um, a lot of debate about, there's been a lot more debate about the racial impacts of these policies. Um, in there's like a sort of sub world of data science where people are working on algorithmic fairness issues and, and the issues associated with uh, these instruments have often been treated as like an important test case in that literature. So there's a lot more thinking about um, these problems. Um, but I would say um, the momentum in this direction has maybe slowed a little bit, but it's still continued, right? Like more and more states are using these risk instruments in more and more, in more, and more stages. Um, and a lot of uh, progressive criminal justice reformers have actually pushed for it. Why? Um, uh, I think it's because they think it's better than the alternative and they think that the um, ability to get criminal justice reform passed, like banning money bail, for instance, which is an equality catastrophe, um, would, um, is advanced by being able to say, look, we're not being soft on crime, we're putting this risk assessment in the, tool, in, in the uh, reform package and that means we're being smart on crime, right? It's, it makes it uh, sellable. And they think maybe that having these risk assessments isn't any worse than the judgments that would be being made consciously or subconsciously by the judge anyway, right? And so I see where those points are coming from, right? Um, to me though, there's something that's like profoundly depressing about the idea that the way to respond to all of the many ways in which our criminal justice system is already screwed up is by locking in discrimination into instruments that we're specifically directing um, people to um, use. I feel like we, we should be able to do better than 
um, uh, than that. I also think that it's not the case that algorithmic tools necessarily displace the biases that come in human decisions. Because humans are still making the decisions, right? You're just giving them the risk score. Um, and so it could be that the risk score just compounds the biases that they, um, that they already have. Um, OK, so as these three examples suggest, we have a pretty sharp incongruity um, between, um, the, uh, between uh, what I think the formal law is in our country about statistical discrimination and the way some of these practices play out on the ground. Like, why, why does that persist? Um, so I think, like, in some ways, um, things that we would never allow to happen without those statistical tools are being allowed to happen, right? So if you, if you had, like, a judge just coming in or, um, or like, allowing a um, defense counsel to argue to the jury, um, oh, um, you know, this girl would never have made much money in her life. And you know that because she's a black girl, right? And they didn't have the actuarial tables to point to. They, and they didn't have it couched in, here is our scientific prediction of her, um, of her um, uh, expected future earnings, et cetera. Um, I think people would gasp, right? Like it would never happen. Um, and yet you have it couch, you have it in this formal looking expert report at, citing actuarial tables, et cetera. And all of a sudden, um, this veneer of science cloaks this act of discrimination. And people don't dig very hard into it. Um, psychological research in lots of contexts tells us that human beings are generally primed to defer to experts. Um, and I think that people without technical training really don't necessarily try very hard to understand things that are quantitative, right? You hear the words regression model or statistical adjustment or something, and your eyes start to glaze over a little bit. And somebody says, well, this is the practice in our field. This is what all forensic economists do. And this is what I've done in thousands of other cases. And you might think, oh, there must be some scientific reason that it has to be that way. And lawyers, I think, do, it, do that all the time. Um, so I'm here to encourage you, students, to not be that kind of lawyer, right? Like, I don't care whether you don't have formal statistical training, your minds are capable of understanding the basics, right, of what quantitative, like these things, these phenomena that, I'm just, that I've just described to you, they are not complicated. Like you can wrap your heads around them. And if you don't understand something that an expert says in a courtroom, for instance, ask somebody and keep asking questions until you do, right? Because believe that you're, you're, that you are capable of this. Because if you turn the other way and just always defer to what the normal practice is in some scientific field, you may miss injustices that are happening in front of your, your nose. And you also may miss ways to help your client um, that, are, uh, that are happening in front of your nose. Second, I think that courts are, and lawyers are particularly bad at calling attention to things that are bad that are done by other courts and lawyers, right? Like we see this in prosecutorial misconduct cases, right? Like um, where uh, a court will be willing to find that there's misconduct in a case um, sufficiently serious to justify reversing a defendant's conviction, but they will never name the prosecutor in the opinion. Um, why? Because that's too embarrassing to the prosecutor. Um, and there's this sort of norm of like respect and courtesy in the profession which I think it's nice to have a profession that's respectful and courteous. That's all very well and good until I think it comes at the expense of disrespect for the human rights of the people um, who the system is supposed to serve, right? Um, and so um, I, think, I think that may be part of it, right? Like, so it's easier, even if you want to push um, to have a more favorable table introduced in your case, to say, oh, this is more appropriate to use, and that's what the courts sometimes say, as opposed to, um, if we didn't use this, we'd be violating the Constitution because it would be race discrimination, right? Um, and so as a result, these practices like don't end up being, um, being publicly uh, called out. And then third, in the, in the underlying technical fields themselves, which include neuropsychology in the NFL case, um, forensic economics, uh, practices all throughout medicine, um, lots of other places, uh, uh, like uh, criminology um, and, uh, and forensic psychology, where the risk assessment instruments were developed. Um, there is 
I think many people who consider themselves to basically be being engaged in a purely descriptive science, right, where their whole goal is to just get the most accurate predictions possible um, without thinking of, like, what are the equity consequences when the predictions are used to make a decision in a certain way? They think, that's not my job to think about, right? Like, so the forensic economist who produces the prediction of earnings may just think, like, I'm just doing my job. Like, this is what, this is what the data say. You asked me for my best prediction of their lifetime earnings. Um, this is what I'm going to um, present. And so you have, and it's the lawyer's jobs to worry about equity, right? And then you have the lawyers being like, well, we're just going to defer to what the scientist said based on the, the norms in the field. And it ends up that like nobody is digging, um, is digging in. Um, I had prepared some comments about race norming in medicine. Um, I don't think I have time to go through all of them, but just know that this thing that they do with diagnosis of dementia, um, very similar things happen in tons of other areas of medicine, um, like uh, explicitly because of their race and the role that race plays in cl um, explicit uh, clinical practice algorithms, which are like checklists to decide diagnoses or practice um, or you know, care decisions, referrals for care, et cetera. Um, it is harder, all symptoms and life exp and uh, reported experiences equal. It is harder for a black person to get admitted for um, pulmonary um, for uh, for pulmonary care to get admitted um, for uh, cardiac um, for heart failure. Um, it's harder for them to get diagnosed with kidney disease and with more advanced levels of kidney disease, which puts black people lower on the um, on uh, the kidney transplant list. There's tons and tons of other examples, um, and. I have spent the last couple of months like trying to dig into the scientific basis for these distinctions. And, you know, and I went into it with the open mind thinking like, surely doctors are, you know, they're trying to use the best evidence that's available to, um, to get the best uh, diagnoses possible, to not over-diagnose, to, um, um, to channel care where it's really needed. And maybe that is the motivation, but let me tell you, the science that is reported even by defenders of some of these categorizations is very weak. Some of it, um, very often what they're doing is finding a difference that exists across groups in some value that's a health indicator, um, like uh, the amount that you can exhale, lung exhalation value. Um, that's seen as an indicator of pulmonary disease. And it turns out that on average, um, in studies, black people tend to be able to exhale less air. And the, re and the way that's accounted for in pulmonary medicine is to change the norms and to evaluate black people um, who come in with pulmonary symptoms only relative to the norms for black people. Whereas there's another potential explanation for this, right? That's that there are actually higher rates of pulmonary disease in the black population, which is a major health disparity that needs to be addressed because of higher workplace and home exposures to air pollutants and all kinds of other uh, socioeconomic factors that condition um, exposure. So the way these, these things work, and it's true in a bunch of other contexts, is to basically define away a, a disparity by using the disparity itself as the baseline for assessing people's um, health. It's deeply troubling, and I just want to flag that I'm not raising this just to randomly criticize medicine, but also to point out that there's a whole bunch of anti-discrimination laws overlapping the state, federal laws, et cetera, that govern medicine. And in the debate about changing these, these, um, these uh, racialized practice guidelines, which is beginning to emerge, that Ada Falls Scandal has helped to push this along, people are talking about it in terms of medical ethics, in terms of science. I haven't seen a single article yet where any one of the doctors involved in this debate says, hey, does the law tell us anything about what we should be doing here? It does. Um, and um, I feel like lawyers and doctors should be, um, uh, should be aware of and thinking about that fact. Um, OK, uh, we are almost out of time, and I want to very quickly circle back to Becker. Um, so in the debate, the econ literature that has followed Becker, there is like 
a tension in whether this distinction between case-based and statistical discrimination is meant to be normative. That is, are we, is it just that we're trying to understand the different mechanisms of discrimination better so we can better attack them? Which I think is a, sort of an, an unobjectionable reason to try to draw this distinction. And his insight that uh, statistical discrimination is one way that people discriminate um, is an important one descriptively. It's actually played a major role in some of my own empirical um, work. Or are we saying that there's something that is worse about taste-based discrimination and more defensible, defensible about statistical discrimination? And I think that there's a division in, in economics about this question. But I think there is definitely a strain of economic thinking that suggests that rational statistical um, discrimination is less something that we should worry about. And I'll give like one last example, which is uh, there's this huge literature that now I think more or less dominates the empirical economic literature on uh, discrimination, um, which is called outcome tests or hit rate tests, um, which look at like what happens downstream, the outcome of, of a particular interaction, in order to decide whether discrimination occurred at the beginning of that interaction. So example, um, if a police officer stops black people at one rate and stops uh, white people at one rate, the question wouldn't be, are they stopping people at different rates or what are the reasons that they're doing so? You would look at, well, what rate do they actually find drugs when they do those, um, those searches? And the model that goes into these tests says that um, an unbiased police, that essentially that a police officer is unbiased and not discriminating if the rates, if the search produces contraband at the same rate. Details of the model don't need to really be explained. Um, the upshot here, though, is that in the model, the assumption actually is that the unbiased, non-discriminating cop is taking race into account, but doing so in a way that is uh, empirically valid and leads to him being able to maximize the overall, uh, the overall hit, wit, hit rate and equalize hit rates across groups. Um, the, in fact, a failure to take race into account in these models um, would be seen as, to as, as a form of discrimination, essentially, in our hypo that we started with. If the cop didn't do what he was doing, these models would say he was discriminating against white people by failing to take it into account. Um, so my uh, submission to any economists in the room, and particularly anyone who maybe edits a journal, <laughs> is um, if you are with me that we shouldn't be drawing this distinction as a normative matter, then maybe think about not publishing papers that take as a premise that this distinction is both morally important and you know, is something that we should actually care about. Uh, OK, way over time, so. Um. OK, so to briefly summarize for the recording, the core question is, like, if it is true that the uh, decision of the criminal justice algorithm that doesn't take race into account but does take all these other race correlated factors into account. If it's like that could still be better than a judge who covertly takes race itself into account, right? And so couldn't it be an improvement? And I guess, you know, this then gets back into the question of like if we think something is super screwy about the status quo, should we pick this other thing that is modestly less so and lock it in as something we're actually going to tell uh, judges to use? Um, or should we you know, try other strategies to, to reduce biases in the system? Um, also, though, I think there's an empirical question as to, because it is judges still who are using the instruments, right? Does it displace their discretion in that way? Um, uh, the best study that I've seen, um, it's uh, by Megan Stevenson and Jennifer Doliak about um, uh, the, uh, they call it, I think, something like algorithms in the hands of humans or something like that to emphasize um, at this point. Um, they find that the adoption of a risk assessment instrument at least doesn't seem to have reduced racial disparity. And they find some suggestive uh, evidence that in the jurisdictions that relied on it the most, that racial disparity actually increases. The theory being that like, essentially judges are more convinced by the high risk assessments when they amplify the assumptions that they were already making and conversely um, for the, the low risk assessments. <laughs>
Yeah, so this is something that uh, due to time, I didn't have, have time to get in the talk, but into the talk, but like should we be, you know, if we're so adamantly committed to this individualistic vision of the, um, of, uh, the equal protection clause, isn't that this, uh, and this firm idea that we can like never use racial classifications, then isn't that gonna mean, you know, can't we carry that over uh, to say, um, you know, to, uh, it doesn't make it easier to say, well, why are you relying on the generalization that having um, more uh, black and Hispanic students in a room adds diversity? Aren't you making assumptions about who they are based on, um, uh, based on their race, et cetera? And I think the answer is it could strengthen those logics, to be frank. I think that the court is committed to going that direction anyway, regardless of what it does on, the, um, on uh, these um, uh, underlying um, statistical generalization rules. Um, my perspective on it, because I associate myself with this sort of it, this anti-subordinationist um, approach uh, to equality law, is that the the logic doesn't work. Uh, the the reason that the logic doesn't work um, for me, as applied to um, a, a a doctrine where, or a context in which you have an equality promoting work for um, uh, role of the generalization. It, it almost it isn't. It's the same reason. It's the same reason that in general I don't think I think differently about uh, discrimination that amplifies uh, structural inequalities in society and, and um, classifications that um, that reduce it. It doesn't depend uh, on what our rule is or isn't about statistical generalizations. Um, I just don't think that equality promoting uses of race should be subject to strict scrutiny. Like, um, like we don't subject, like this, this whole thing about statistical generalizations that I just said, it doesn't mean that the government or other decision makers can't rely on any statistical generalizations. I mean, you know, that like the University of Chicago can't, fit, can't think that grades in undergraduate are a good predictor of law school performance, et cetera. Like basically we take into account factors that are just generalizations all the time, but it's just certain categories of factors that are equality law concerns us with, and the reason that it concerns us uh, that, that we pick certain factors as being suspect and not others is because of the, the history and present continu continued legacy of inequality and, dis um, and oppression that's associated with those factors. And to me, that legacy isn't present when you flip it the other way, and so the case for treating, so I would treat statistical generalizations that run in that direction, the same as a statistical generalization that grades in one level predict grades in another level. Like it's it's just not something that invites heightened scrutiny. The court does not agree with me, but I don't think they would agree with me regardless of what they're gonna conclude about statistical generalizations. Thank you.